I'm from Boston, right? And yeah. there's a, a friend of my pops, they had this spot called Nubian Notion. Mm -hmm. So it was like, almost like, you know, about four or five Malcolm X's, OG, OG neighborhood dudes that wore dashikis. Yeah. So that was the young version of me. Yeah. Then probably like high school, I have, you know, young, you know, my homies that cut. Yeah. And we do, you know, the bedroom cuts and all that. You know what I mean? It was like, but the Nubian Notion was great because that was like, you know, you're getting that, that, you know, that educated black militant talk yeah, yeah, at yeah. eight and ten, you know what I mean? Right. They talk about stuff I ain't understand. They talk about owners, owning real, real estate and they own businesses and own real estate. Actually, the guy Sharif, which was my pop's friend, actually owns a lot of the neighborhood. Mm. Yeah, you know what I mean? So he, he the was, guy that owned the barbershop? Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, him, him and his father owned the barbershop. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was dope, Nubian Ocean, and they had kind of like the, the spot that was like the biggest transit hub, if you was, was a spot called Dudley Station. Mm -hmm. They also had a store there too. Mm -hmm. It was like everyone. So everybody knew Nubian Ocean when yeah, you grew yeah, up, yeah. 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 Jay, what, what, what's bringing you to Detroit, bro? Huh? You know, getting to this, we're putting together a media company, but um, you know, in its, in its simplest form, it's a label, mm -hmm. but it's, it's going to be more than music. It's going to grow to be more than music, but it's yeah. starting off in music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, my, my, my history and my background is music, so. How did you start in music? Um, you know what, man? I went to, I went to Hampton in Virginia. Wow. And, um. Thank you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you went to Hampton? Yeah. Yeah, all right. You know what I'm saying? So, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was a finance major, but I always did music. I think I've been messing with music since I was 13, 14, turn, you know, turntables. I didn't own any equipment. So I used to go into music stores and just sit there and learn the machines, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, use the keyboards. And so by the time I was about 18, I knew a lot, a lot of the keyboards just from going into music stores until they kicked me out. Mm. You know what I mean? So. And are you from a musical family? Nah. How did you nah. Play? I mean, I'd say musical in terms of they listen to a lot of yeah, music, yeah, 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 yeah. but not, not, especially my aunt. I had an aunt that had a really nice record collection. Mm. My pops and stepmoms had a decent collection, but my aunt is the one who really had a collection. At some point, I actually jacked some of her collection. Mm -hmm. That ended up being a little issue, but like you know, you know, you, you learn, you, we progress, <laughs> try not to steal. Yeah. But at the time, I, I, I stole some of her vinyl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Now I'm probably not gonna know a lot of his music, but like, what was some of that music that influenced? Oh, Minnie Rippleton, Stevie Wonder. Okay. I know. Yeah, but Boston was different though, because Boston. The good thing about Boston was, as much as I knew about, I started learning about soul and all that type of stuff and rap. Yeah. But it, I started learning about rock and punk rock too, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because that's just from being in Boston yeah. and going to school in a mixed community and all that type of shit, so. I hear Boston is racist and it still is in a lot of ways. But you know, What's that look like? I think if you, if you talk about East Coast cities, mm -hmm. Detroit, Chicago, it's probably more Chicago and Philly than it is, than it is Detroit. Mm -hmm. But you talk about, it's like a neighborhood city, mm -hmm. you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So that's how it's more, I wouldn't, Call it more racist than another place. It's just that neighborhoods. You got an Irish neighborhood. You got an Italian neighborhood. You know, and you know. Yeah, super segregated. Yeah, you got to be yeah. careful. You know, yeah. you go in certain neighborhoods at the wrong time. You know what I mean? And you ain't, you ain't, in, you ain't supposed to be there, or you ain't with the right folks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, that's that's it's more like that. Yeah. You know, but I also like that shit. Wasn't no passive aggressive racism. If they were racist, they was racist. Yeah. It was like, well, you know doing that, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't like that. So that I like the fact that it was in your face and it wasn't that subliminal, that that's passive aggressive shit. So, yeah. you know. So at 13, you start going to these, you know. Yeah, I think, so I, there was a cat in the, um, there was a cat in the neighborhood who was a little older than us. I went to school with two of his younger brothers yeah. named Ant Green. Yep. He was kind of like the jazzy Jeff of my neighborhood, real precise yeah, yeah. DJ cutter, like nice. He was real nice. And um, so he had, he had given one of my, actually a friend of mine who's long time been in radio. Um, it's me and him, the only one with the music industry that I grew up with, um, and he became a DJ. Mm. So he gave him, he bought a set of turntables off of him, and then I bought his turntables. And so that, that, was, the, that was the start. I think my man was 14, I was 13. Mm. And that was kind of the start. But, but the difference is he, he sort of gravitated to being a DJ, I was more interested in like started dissecting the records. Yep. Like, you know what I mean? Like how I started wanting to understand how the music was being made mm. and being put together. Mm. So I think that was the difference. How long of a time period between like becoming that inquisitive and that curious about the music, like how long were you doing it before you started like trying to dissect it? No, I started dissecting it pretty quickly. Right yeah, so I'd say about 14, maybe 15. Okay. Yeah, and that's really because I started stumbling on music. You know, there's a, there's a really nice, um, 
good, you know, Berkeley School of Music is down yeah. there. So around Berkeley was a bunch of music stores. Mm -hmm. And I started going in, just stumbling on them and started discovering the equipment and the gear. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, and that's when you start really understanding, like, oh, this is what's making the drums. This is what the keyboard sounds is coming from. Yeah, yeah. The bass and instruments. So I, had, I knew a little bit of piano and a little drum. I knew how to play. I had taken piano lessons a little bit, took a little drum, you know, when I was younger. But when I got to Hampton, um, there was a partner of mine that was a year older than me that went to the same high school as me. He had a studio in his off-campus apartment. And Hampton, you know, freshmen had curfew. Mm -hmm. So I would go over his off, you know, I would go over to his apartment to escape curfew. Mm -hmm. And then um, he had a studio. So, and he had actually some nice equipment. So I would say, shoot, in like six months, I was probably nicer on his equipment than him. Wow. You know, six, eight months, you know, I started, you know, learning it. And then I talked to school, the head of the music department, because Hampton had a studio, and I talked him into letting me use the studio. Mm -hmm. So I would just get, he would, he would give me studio time. Yeah. And that's really how it started. That's dope. Yeah. That's dope. And then it evolved. Yeah. Hampton. Yeah, well, everything was Hampton. Ha Hampton was a melting pot of stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. Hov was down there hustling. Mm -hmm. Diddy was throwing parties. You know what I mean? Like, it was a lot going on in Hampton. Yeah. Iverson's from there. Timberland's from there. Pharrell's yeah, yeah, from there. Yeah, yeah. You know, I met Pharrell and Chad down and then. Teddy set up shop there, Teddy Riley. So my first deal was with Teddy Riley. Why was that happening in Virginia at that time? I don't even know, man. I think it's just, well, you know, Hampton had a lot of girls. Okay, okay. So that attracted, yeah. you know, it was like, shoot, it might have been 10 to 1 girls, <laughs> girls and dudes. Yeah. And then you had all that around there. So it was Hampton, it was Norfolk. It was, um, so you had Norfolk State, you had ODU, yeah. you had Virginia Beach, you had Portsmouth, you had Newport News, all of that right around there. So, you know, Iverson was from Hampton, you know, um, Pharrell and them was from like Virginia Beach, mm -hmm. Timberland, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So it was all this going on. Missy was from Portsmouth all in the same area, you know what I mean, so. Is it anywhere that exists like that now? Are you seeing that same energy anywhere now? Well, I mean, you know, people get their moments. I mean, you know, even right now, this is, you know, you, you know, you tell me too, because it looks like there's a, you know, there's a, a Detroit thing happening right now. There's definitely a resurgence of what's going on in Detroit. There's yeah. a lot of artists. You see different people coming here signing artists. Yo Gotti was up here signing somebody. Yeah. You know, Lil Yachty's doing collabs. I mean, everyone's, you know, really, you know, Big Sean's coming back, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. Now, I guess it's going to take time to see what manifests to yeah. really understand, like. Mm -hmm. I think everybody gets a spot, you know what I mean? I think everybody gets a time. Mm -hmm. It was a time when Memphis got hot again, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And um, New Orleans with NBA Youngboy and all those dudes coming out of there. Yeah. Then it was Texas, Yellow Beezy and all those dudes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, you know, different spots get, get a look and then everybody's like, oh, okay, let, let, we got to go see what's going on over there for a minute. And then that spot might get a run, you know what I mean? Where you get you get a bunch, four or five, six artists start getting deals and get yeah. on, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, New York had a run for a minute when what's the kid that the rainbow hair kid and, and um mm -hmm. A Boogie mm -hmm. with the hoodie and yeah, yeah, yeah. Cardi B and yeah. you know, you had about five or six New York rappers all of a sudden. Yeah. Casanova, you know. So this music means so much to the culture. It is so the culture. Feet, right, right. Yeah. But you talk about like these deals and I feel like well, it's it, like these record labels are almost like bad venture capital firms a lot of times. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to think they still got terms that was in the same. They got terms in the record labels that was still in the contracts in the 50s. Mm. And in some cases, they're even worse because, mm -hmm. you know, they got to participate. You know, you, you know, the term 360. Yeah, yeah. But basically, that just means that hands in the artist's pocket more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these other incomes that the labels used to not touch, they got to reach in more, you know, and, and what it is, is just the evolution of the, the, the economics. So if you keep it in that legacy model, you know what I'm saying? That's why they got to do it, because based on that legacy model. But the problem is the legacy model, you know, it's still a plantation system. Yeah. You know what I mean? So break down what a 360 deal is. 360 deal is a recording contract mm -hmm. and, a, and a recording contract is, you know, you, you get a loan for a house, and you pay back your loan, then you own the house. Yep. You know, when you get a loan to do your album and you pay it back, you get you got a royalty, which is a percentage of the of the of this, the profit. So you don't own the master. The copyright is the master. And it's really important in this day and age that you own masters because the biggest income streaming, you know, the majority of music is consumed by streaming. Mm -hmm. And for streaming services such as Spotify, Apple, they're known as DSPs. Um, digital service provider, mm -hmm. they have to license 
the master owners. Mm -hmm. The majority of master owners are obviously major labels and the majority of artists do not participate in that. So that's millions and millions of dollars in master ownership licensing fees that DSPs pays that artists don't participate in. So they, they participate in the performance, which means how many times your record is listened to. Mm -hmm. But for your record to even be on that service, they have to pay. Mm. And, and, and the most artists don't participate in that. Chance the Rapper does, because yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. he owns, you know what I mean? And so when you hear people talking about they own their masters, they're participating in that or, or, or getting it all. You know what I mean? So. But we've been watching this as a consumer. I've been watching, I've been seeing it. Are artists not aware that this is happening? Are no. they seeing the bread and they're like, I need the bread right now? Like, why nah, is they're, it continuing to happen? They're, they're aware, but you know, it's, it's a game of leverage. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like anything, yeah, man. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And you got to think, most artists ain't coming from place of economic resources. Yeah, yeah. You know, so most artists are just trying to get on. Yeah. You know what I mean? And trying to, you know, live, create music. And this is the opportunity to exist. Yeah. So if someone's offering you 250000 and you ain't got, you know, and maybe you was in the street or maybe you had a job and you was working a full-time job and you, you got 250000 in your pocket, you're going to take it. Because yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's a chance to live your dream. Mm -hmm. And then you find other ways to make money, touring, merch, you know, d different ways, endorsements. Yeah. You know, most people, when they get a record deal, the only money they see from their record deal is in advance, mm -hmm. which is just debt. Mm -hmm. You know, but they, most times they never see royalties. So my record deal is alone. And then my signing bonus, my advance is a loan. It's a loan. It's just debt. You know, How but a lot of people don't look at it because, well, they make money. Normally, you get out there and you tour, you know, you, big, you, you build up your shows. So, you, you know, the majority of artists that you see that are making really good money is their touring money and their endorsements. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You start, you know, there's, and, and then it's late night, you know what I mean? Meaning you got the tour money and then you got the late night back, you know, paper bag money. Mm -hmm. Run through the club. I mean, shoot, I used to, I used to, you know, be with 2 chains sometimes, he'd go two, three spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So he yeah. might pick up another hundred. Yeah. Damn. You know? That's crazy. 30 minutes here, 30 minutes there, 30 minutes one more spot. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Depending on how hard you want to work. Yeah. You know, it's like same with the DJs. You know, you got some DJs that's willing to work. You know, you got DJs that, you know, <laughs> might, might do three cities in a night, especially in Europe. You know, they might do London early and some, you know, do Paris and then do a late night set somewhere else in Germany or something, you know, make, make a bag in each city. So it's really about on that. It's about your work ethic. Mm -hmm. So if you're really willing to work, you know, you, you know, you can still make money. Yeah. Yeah. Let me go a different direction. So I'm reading data and a lot of what we're doing with the social club, with Shop Talk, is we're trying to like talk to black men about what it looks like to live life well. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And I read some data and I'm like, I'm trying to help solve this problem about black men living life well because we're the population that has the lowest life expectancy. Yeah. And so highest pri highest proven shit. population. Right, right. Yep. But then I look at like the culture that we built and the culture that we're from, and then we're putting on record, and I'm looking at the relationship between this 15 to 24 year old, like the number one cause of death is homicide. Yeah. And 49.7 percent of black males that died between the age of 15 and 24 died because of homicide. Yep. Do you it, feel like the music? Well, is I feel education is it poverty? Well, like what? Well, it's a cycle. We've yeah. been in. It's been a cycle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the one thing I do know about, you know, I, I was fortunate. I grew up in. A, I grew up in the hood, mm -hmm. but I was bused to a Jewish community. Yep. And I saw the difference in my community and the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And so, in the Jewish community, you know, you didn't have a liquor store on every corner. Mm -hmm. You didn't have check cash in places like that. You didn't. You know, it was a different thing. And then, if you go in the Jewish community. The people that owned the businesses in the Jewish community were Jewish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, if you go in my hood, the, you know, the Chinese store was owned by the Asians. You know, the, you know, the cleaners was owned by another nationality. The liquor store was owned by another nationality. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, if you also think about the home ownership, a lot of the home ownership was outside of the community mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So I think you, if you put this cycle of poverty in it, you know what I mean? And, and then you add in the economic situations, right? Yeah. You know, lack of education, lack, which, you know, obviously black men with records, 
making it more difficult to get jobs, yep. you know what I mean, and, and so on and so forth. And then there's the other side of the homicide thing. So meaning there's the guy who committed the homicide, so meaning somebody's getting killed, yeah. but the guy who committed the homicide, now he's getting jailed. So now yep. you took out two people. Yep, yep, yep. So every time that happens, it's two people going down. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they just keep taking away. And, and it, it really, my, the one thing is that I feel like I was empowered young, and, and this is having my pops in the house, mm -hmm. but I really feel like information. You know what I'm saying? So I had two other first cousins who both did 20 years for murder. Mm -hmm. And I was the one who made it out. You know what I mean? I had my pops, I had sports. He kept me out of the streets with sports, you know? And, and it was information, yeah. you know what I mean? These two, my other two, they didn't have the information, yeah. you know? And, and, and that really was the difference in my, in my life, in my yeah. situation. Yeah. So I definitely feel like we're caught up in a vicious cycle. Now, going back to the music, when I came up in my generation, I think, you know, 90s, if you will, I really came up on late 80s, early 90s hip hop. You had the negative shit in terms of the gun violence, da da da, but you also had the balance. Mm -hmm. You know, you had the positive rap, which was flavor, like, you know, Tribe Called Quest, you had all, so there was a yin and the yang. So now the problem is now it's out of balance. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? For every childish Gambino there's not, or, and Chance the Rapper, there's 10 other. You know, there's 10 others talking about guns and murder and blah, 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 and selling drugs and chains and that. So it's, it's the balance is out of whack. And that's what, and, it, and it, it still goes back to the record labels though, right? Because it's what they choose to invest in. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, cool, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna hire 10 of these gun toters. We're going to invest in that versus like balance it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, and that's like say good music where, you know, we would sign a big Sean. Might have a push a T, but when we have all this other stuff, they balance it out. So the only one you're talking about any negative or drug stuff was Pusha T. And, and Pusha T was part of the culture, so it was like, even though he was drug rap, he was, he was you know, he came from Pharrell and, and Virginia, and it was a thing. So we balance, you know, the whole thing was about the balance. Yeah. From entertainment and high-level taste rap and educated rap, you know, to entertainment with Big Sean and so on and so forth. So it was a balance. And that's not what's happening across the board. You know, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not knocking anybody, you know, yeah. any, anybody's hustle because everybody's trying to get their money and come yeah. up. And, yeah. you know, and when you come from nothing to something, you know, you, you got to be a proud, proud of that and applaud that anyway, yeah. or a young entrepreneur. Yeah. But with the same thing, I feel like at some point it becomes a responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Top did with, mm -hmm. with, you know, he came, he came from a gang situation, you know what I mean? But, you know, and he had J-Rock who's gang, you know, come from a gang situation, but he balanced it. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? For J-Rock, you got a Kendrick. You know what I mean? For Schoolboy Q, you got an Ab Soul. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You got an Isaiah Ryder. You got a Scissor. So to me, they're the modern label that's done it. Obviously, Dreamville is doing it now. Yeah. You know what I mean? QC still a little bit more on the hood side, but that's what they know. Yeah. You know, and they, and they'll and hopefully they they come. Hopefully they keep progressing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But I think that's what they know. So you know, you get the Migos, you get little baby, you get city girls, and then maybe now they elevate from there. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But for me, I came up, you know, like, like I said, my, you know, in the home, my family was listening to Stevie Wonder and Earth, Wind & Fire. Yeah. You know, so I studied that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I studied, you know, the chords that we used and the feelings that was, it provided. So, when, you know, we create music. I'm, I'm, that's the repertoire. I mean, that's the vocabulary I'm speaking from. Mm -hmm. You know? Not to say I can't do the hard stuff, yeah. but I also got to like, I got to, you know, I got to play, I got to do something with some feeling. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're making a record to me that's got feeling and soul and emotion, then you're gonna naturally write something positive or good energy with it or, you know what I mean? Right. And that's, so I do feel like I'm very, I truly believe music is an influencer, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But, it, but it's more than that too, yeah, right? Yeah. Because it really comes down to, you know, parents and lack of, you know, parental guidance in some situations mm -hmm. and things of that nature, yeah. you know? You know, I know some really dope 15 year old rappers that I'm, that I'm real cool with, mm -hmm. you know? They already toting guns. Mm -hmm. one of the, I'm not gonna name his, my, yeah. one of my young boys' name from DC, yeah. but literally the first meeting I had when 15 year old, he got two Glocks in his waist, mm -hmm. and he's like, "Yo, Che, I'm not really even promoting this. This is just purely my day to day su survival." Mm -hmm. He's like, "You know, so when I move from my hood to da da da, I gotta move like this, you know, what I mean? and that's his reality. Yeah. So I can't. So when he talks about it on record, yeah. I can't not." understand that I get it you know what I mean that's his circumstance that's what he knows yeah. you know what I mean that's his every day yeah. you know what I mean until he gets out of that circumstance and then you know that's still once again that's still what he knows yeah. so I can't hold that against him mm -hmm. the biggest thing I can do is try to inform him mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. one of the things I always do and, and they always call me OG for this because mm -hmm. I be hitting them with books and shit yeah, like yeah. that you know I got what, cast reading books and all that what books 
Um, right now, I just posted a book. Um, it's basically a formula, so most a field manual for the for the music business mm -hmm. that I just posted. It's called um, Made Luck. So you got to get the information where they at. Where they at? They on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's about converting them from where they at yeah. and what they into and what they use. They yeah. into Instagram stories. They into Instagram. They some of them on Snapchat. Yeah. Some of them on TikTok. Mm -hmm. You got to get the it got to the information got to come from there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? The same time where they doing Facebook Live and Instagram Live and all that shit and doing shit on crimes on camera and all that. Let's balance it out. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Once again, provide the balance, mm -hmm. inform information. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's why what you're doing here is beautiful, yeah. you know what I mean? Because it's, it's about, but this is the catalyst. It's got to be, it, it can't just be you. It got to be, it got to be a hundred of you, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Where people are sending out information and talking about stuff and, yeah. and talking about how to do this, how to build a business, you know what I mean? What was your first business? Uh, my first, well, just production. Okay. My first production. I tried, I made a stab at maybe about, I've been with Ye, I was with Ye for about six, seven years. Mm -hmm. In between that, I had left Dre. And I started a company called Cops and Robbers. Mm -hmm. The whole idea was the same thing, kind of like take from the corporations <laughs> and give it some Robin Hood shit, like yeah. take from the corporations, give back to the creatives. Yeah. And I got it funded by my partner who was um, from the Campbell Soup family. Mm. But then he ended up going through a, a divorce. Mm. So the company got dissolved. We only, got it, we only had it rocking for about six, for about six months. But the whole concept of it was you partner with artists. I, you, don't, you don't sign artists, you mm. partner with them. Mm. You know what I'm saying? He, Nick, Nick know what I'm talking about. We've been talking about it yeah. for a couple months now. You know what I mean? He's been yeah. building his company. And, you know, hopefully, we, you know, I can get my business to a place where we can partner yeah. and I can support what he's doing yeah. and I can support other young entrepreneurs, you know, and that's the whole thing. Yeah. And that's, and then, you know, I pull up him, maybe he pulls up two more, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and that's, that's the whole, that's the whole idea because the whole idea is to provide alternatives so we don't got to go slime, sign those plantation deals. Yeah. Those, I call them Cadillac record deals. Because <laughs> that's, you know, that's the Cadillac record model. Yeah, you know. How many, how many people in the industry are thinking like this? It's coming around. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Steve Stout started a company. I don't yeah. know if he quite got the formula yet, but at least he's doing it. Yeah. There's another company called STEM. This young lady, Milana, founded it. Really good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Who gives me really, actually, really good business advice, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, you know, these disruptive platforms and things are coming. Yeah. More and more people are building their own labels and so on and so forth. I got my, my man Neek, and fan, he got his company, Family Circle. Mm -hmm. I got my man Ray out of the DMV area. He got his company. Um, and young 23-year-old 23, 23 guy went to UPenn, black dude from the hood, but he went he Ivy League educated. Yeah. You know what I mean? I got, a, I got, some, I got some partners in um, New York. Obviously, one of them you guys know, um, he's got... He's signed, Cardi B is signed in Brooklyn Johnny. Mm -hmm. He's built. He's building. You know, young entrepreneur. He's um, he's got a. You know, he's buying. You know, he's taking his money. He built a spa now. You know what I mean? Dope, so, dope, dope. you know, um, Angela Yee yeah. is my my, my homegirl from the radio. She's um, she's buying real estate in in Detroit and yeah. and she's got a juice bar. You know, with my with my partners, the Locks, my yeah. man Styles P, and he got the juice bars. I know there was yeah, so it's about Styles, he got three or four spots. Mm -hmm. So my point is the sharing of the information, mm -hmm. the sharing of the information and then being the entrepreneurs and owning. Shout out to Rosalind with Detroit is the new black, yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You know? why, why do you feel like, do you feel like in our culture, and I feel, I feel like because it's been such a lack of resources or perceived lack of resources in the past, we like hold on to those resources and we don't. Yeah, we don't share. We, yeah, we don't. Yeah, we don't share it like we should. And now we're sharing information. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But so, the key is, even before the resources are shared, the information got to be shared. Yeah, yeah. Because if the information is shared and you're giving right, people the right codes, mm -hmm. they can get to it. So, like for instance, you know, I started this business. If I had the right codes from day one, it may maybe take me three months and not a year. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you know, I had to get to the right codes. You know, um, I really, I really appreciate Jay Z for opening up his home. He opened up his home for me for about five or six different times yeah. to sit one on one with him in the living room and gave me cheat codes. You know what I mean? And I appreciate that. You know, everyone don't have the opportunity to go sit with Jay Z and Quincy, but hopefully I can do the same and share. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And share the codes they gave me. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so. So, and I think that's important. I think that's what we're trying to accomplish with this platform. We're trying yeah. to like, we have access to all these people because we're, we're we we care about our craft, and then. We try to share that access, yeah. and then you have all this access. We're trying to get you to share yeah. the access. Yep. So let's just share one cheat code with us that you have, that you got from Jay, that you got from Quincy, 
know what I'm saying? Like the last time I actually cried, bro, I watched that Quincy documentary. Documentary, okay. That's heavy, and, I saw and, that. And I shared a tear, yeah. bro, like. You gotta watch the Clarence Avant one too. Crazy, the Black Godfather, yeah, yeah, crazy. Yeah. He is like a black these Godfather. guys, Clarence Avon, I had never heard of Clarence yeah. Avon. Yeah. And he's moved, like he's moving. He's moving mountains you know behind the saying? scenes, exactly. Uh, that's I aspire to be that. I watched Quincy and saw the influence that he's had yep. on me. Never touched me, never done mm -hmm. Clemson, don't know who I am. Yeah. Influence you, now you here. Yep. Like what are these guys sharing with you that you can share with our with our community? Um well, all right, from Quincy, there was one major thing which, which is, I tried to make it a mantra in my life. I even got it tattooed on my arm. Mm. My, on my arm, my tattoo says, be exceptional daily. Mm. So it's a daily reminder, for an old slack, every day try to get up, be exceptional. So what I learned from Quincy, which he really reinforced, even at 86, he's still learning. Mm -hmm. Every day he tries to learn something new. Mm -hmm. So at 86, this man is still out there learning, doing concerts, doing shit, he's active. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's not just sitting back like, okay, I'm 80, I'm gonna, you know, sit back here and ride away. He's active, he's traveling, you know, he's richer in his mind. So that's really important to, to, to stay learning, stay sharp, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like stay in the dojo, stay in, you know, stay in the library, stay whatever, whatever it is, whatever your process is. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and one of the things I think is that people don't talk about enough is happiness. You know, you're hearing, it's coming up more, which I, what I do like is people talking about mental health more, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because it's always been like, you know, obviously in, more in a white community, it's like, oh, we go get therapy and this and that. In a black community, you might not have that luxury, but don't mean it's meant to help. It might be more trauma, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, we gotta suck it up because it's a survival. It's, mm -hmm. it's really survival, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because, you know, some people, it's like, yeah, they might need therapy, but you know what? They gotta pay the rent, they gotta put food on the table. So as much as they might need to go to therapy, yeah. they ain't got time for that. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I think happiness is, people don't, is, is not valued enough. You know, I think one of the things, I think on my way up, my journey, I was in it, right? Meaning I was just in it, grinding, working hard, you know, trying to take care of the family, this and that. I don't even think I knew what happiness was, was or was trying to make myself happy. Mm -hmm. I don't think I even had an understanding of that until I got older. Mm -hmm. So that was experience where I was like, you know what? As much as I want this paper and I want this other thing, I'm, what's important to me is happiness. Mm -hmm. What's my peace of mind like? What's my daily, you know? So now it's like I'm zened out, you know what I mean? I got a garden, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? I live behind the gates, yeah. you know what I mean? I literally, it's about waking up with peace, you know yeah. what I'm saying? You know, and, and, and that zen. So I think I appreciate that. And that's one of the lessons I learned on the way. Well, from Hove, I would say one of the cheat codes were, was really like whatever it is you're embarking on, if you if you learn whatever it is, if you're open in a juice bar, learn the shit. Like really know it. Like don't be in there gaming. Like you know what I mean. Like don't half ass it. Mm -hmm. I really feel like I'll give an example. And I ain't by no means am I criticizing Puffy, mm -hmm. but I feel like for instance you built a network and you created this opportunity, you created these jobs. But I don't really feel like he made the network as crazy as it could be. Revolt could be. I mean, Lena Waithe could be making shows on Revolt. Mm -hmm. Jordan Peele could be making shows on Revolt. Mm -hmm. You know, Shonda Rhimes could be having shows. Like, Revolt could be crazy. It could mm -hmm. be the biggest network mm -hmm. and everybody supporting it in the MV community. So I, I do feel like there's certain things like that, like where these, they've created these opportunities, and I appreciate that to the jobs, but I feel like they, they stopped mm -hmm. along the way. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And that's not knocking his hustle, but I just feel like as people create these opportunities, same thing, keep, keep you know, don't just get in the door. Get in door and kill it. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. You know. And going back to that happiness point, like how did you, were there steps that you noticeably can look back at that took these steps? This is what yeah. happened. What did that look like? I love good music. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I mean, no. I'm, um, I just looked in my day and I was looking at like, okay, um, Dr. Dre always said this to me. He said, he used to always say, I keep a bullshit environment, a bullshit free environment. He was like, I don't, if someone comes with some bullshit, they gotta go. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, cause obviously he went through what he went through. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, so his whole mission was like, yo, I keep a bullshit free environment. So then I was like, you know, as I, I'm on it and I'm, you know, working in other people's environments, environments I don't control. I realized, okay, you know what? All this energy in here ain't healthy. You know what I mean? Some of this energy is toxic. So is my, my mental health and my health and my zen, is it worth it? Am I, is the compensation, you know what I mean? Nah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's, that was the decision. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, let's take that out. Let's, yeah. You know, and, and I took steps to do that. Yeah. Ulti ultimately, the biggest step was leaving good music, mm -hmm. but even before that. Mm -hmm. 
I really took myself out of situations. I really controlled my schedule and my environment. You know what I mean? Until we really was like in super heated, focused recording mode, mm -hmm. I'd be in my world. You know what I mean? Yeah. Ye, Ye had his world, which is in Calabasas in his office. I had my world in a different spot. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We still interacted, yeah. you know what I mean? But he cultivated his environment how he wanted. I cultivated my environment how I wanted, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. A lot of people, I feel like, and I don't know, I've dealt with my mom, you know, uh, going through mental illness, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. She passed away at 55 years old. Um, yeah. And yeah. she never really was able to live kind of a full life because every time she would start building, she would have an episode every mm -hmm. time she got a job. And, and uh, whenever I would experience anxiety, bro, I would be like scared as fuck thinking that I'm mm -hmm. kind of like, Following that. Following that, you know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. But she was a brilliant woman. Yeah. And I feel like we don't do enough to understand uh, mental illness. Yeah. And like really understand how to kind of wrap our arms around that. Mm -hmm. We do forgive and forgive and forgive yeah. a lot, but I don't think that, you know, we forgive enough. Um, what Ye is going through, I feel like I'm watching my mom at a yeah. certain point. Mm -hmm. I understood how to kind of. Yeah. Uh, work with my mom. What's your opinion on that? Like what Ye is going through and how people are perceiving them? And what's that look like? Well, I think, you know, I think you use Ye as an example, but anybody, like, I mean, it's not even just Ye. Yeah. I think you're going to have, it's a journey. You know, mental health is a journey. You're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days. Mm -hmm. And same thing, it's what's the environment around you. You got a healthy environment around you, you got mm -hmm. a toxic environment around mm -hmm. you. You got something that's gonna inflame mm -hmm. the situation. You know what I mean? There's, there, there's times where I've been around Kanye where certain circumstances enhanced it. Like really, you know, like we had, a, you know, we were in Africa. Africa was kind of crazy, it was an intense situation. So that was, that was something, you know, where the environment inflamed it mm -hmm. versus really calmed it down, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, Martin Lawrence was bipolar, he's also a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he, he would speak to that. Mm -hmm. He would speak to like, you know, with some people we would calm him down weed would trigger his his episodes you know so he was like you know i just had to realize weed ain't for me you know yeah. but, but i grew up in an era where people smoke weed so he was like you know when i get with my partners you know we want to smoke but i can't smoke because yep. you know it doesn't it doesn't calm me down it triggers my bipolar so yeah. you know so i think damn am i bipolar <laughs> i can't smoke bro yeah like, i have anxiety yeah. attacks when i smoke weed it's yeah crazy so it's that's now, that's it's yeah. yeah so yeah. You know, so he told me that. I, oh, I was like, oh shit! I didn't even. I knew, you know, because I heard about the episode, but I didn't really know what he was like. Cause he's so calm and chill in person. So when he told me that, he's telling me some of the things about the Ill illness and the sound. I'm like, oh shit, okay. Mm -hmm. He's like, I got to take steps to, you know, to just maintain daily. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you know, you thinking with these cats, man. I'm like, like you know, this guy's big ass house and yeah, you yeah, rich yeah. as hell and you made all this money. Yeah. But literally every day you dealing with mental health. Yeah. And you're trying to maintain. You know. You're just trying to go survive day to day, you know? I'm like, okay. So that, that those kind of things are wake up calls because, you know, it's like, okay, maybe you ain't going through financial shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe you made it financially, but you're still dealing with real life, everyday shit, yeah. you know? Navigate balance and family with mental health, you know what I'm saying? Trying to be there for your kids, yeah. you know? So it's definitely something that is a, a real thing in our community mm -hmm. that really needs support. Yeah. You know, we don't have the support system as of other communities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know. And what's crazy is when you look at that 15 to 24 year old that, you know, died from gun violence or just homicide in general, you look at the other side of that and it's suicide, right? Yeah. White man is suicide. Yeah. Accidental death is, I think, number two. But number one is suicide. Yeah, I mean, you yeah, think. So uh, dealing with it as well. Rob, yeah, Robert Kennedy's daughter, you know, somebody yeah. who was set for life. Yeah. I mean, Rob, Robert Kennedy's granddaughter, she just committed suicide at 22. She just OD. You know what I mean? That's someone that's set for life. Yeah. Don't got no problems with no money, you know what I mean? Yeah. Live in a mansion, you know what I mean? Compound mansion. Yeah, yeah. But still, you know, so, yeah. so it's real. It's, it's a real situation, you know? From Mac Miller to the, you know, all these different cats.
What's the idea? What's, what's, what are you looking to build right now? New operating system. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's the key right there, is just changing the way of thinking. You know what I mean? Everyone thinks in a legacy model. I just want to think in it. You know, it's just like software. It's like, okay, it's a new operating system. It's 2.0. It's 3.0. So that's really all. I just want to change the thought. And the idea is simply that. It's just the resources and the art and the creators can partner. And, and I want, I'm going to start in music, but it can be, it can be a screenwriter. It could be a photographer. It could be, you know, it could be whatever. Mm -hmm. It's this. It's it's the key word there is creators. Mm -hmm. So the creators, and the and, and the and the resources, mm -hmm. and they find a place of partnership. So there's ownership and open. But I, you know, I'm not I'm not not fiscally responsible. So meaning, based on what the investment is, there should be some sort of recoupment sort of formula, and there should be you know some sort of formula into how the equity splits up in this and that. But I'm truly a believer that the creators need to own in their art. Mm. We were just talking about this about an hour ago. So let's, let's identify the problem. I think a lot of entrepreneurs, myself included, I come up with all these amazing solutions that I think are dope as fuck and then I try to like search for a problem, right? And mm -hmm. we call it a solution, a solution in search for a problem. Yes. You've been in this game a long time. What's the actual problem that you're trying to solve? Just that, like really, there's a lack of ownership from the creators. That's, that's, the, solu that's the problem, right? Yeah, yeah. That's across the board. Mm -hmm. Like literally, if we, if, if I, if we polled 100 artists right now, probably nine, unless they're completely independent, I'd say if we just went through all the major label artists, I'd say at least probably 97, 98% of them have no ownership. And the ones who have anything at the highest level, um, outside of like the Jay-Z's of mm -hmm. the world, mm -hmm. probably just own a percentage of the profit. Yeah. So that's and that and that's what leverage. That means that's the bigger artist. So all this intellectual property, all this, all these words that I'm writing, all these records I'm recording. Yeah, they own their I publishing. Own, they own their publishing. So that's songwriting. They own their publishing, but they don't own their the actual product. They don't own their master, mm -hmm. and that's that's pivotal in this day and age, mm -hmm. because it's it's about master ownership and catalog. So so publishing is one thing. So you want to own your publishing. A lot of people have publishing deals, which means they're either getting administered, which is a good situation. Co-pub deals sometimes is necessary because you got to survive, you got to find ways. So co-pub means they are investing in your, your future royalties. Mm -hmm. So they're partnering with you. They'll advance you, you partner. So some people have to do that. That's just a survival technique, but or it's just necessary. Um, but the master thing is really what I'm trying to change and disrupt. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not to say that, because major labels ain't going nowhere yet because they own all the masters. But they're not going away yet. But I'm just trying to all, you know, create alternatives, you know, be part of that disruption. So, so it's not the only way you got to go. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's still some artists who's going to go that way. Yeah. And they're still going to be able to give, they got the bank, they got the money. So they're still going to be able to give bigger advances. So if I'm like, say, for instance, I'm in a situation where I'm in a bidding war with, with a major, the major's probably going to win, if it's, if it's, especially if it's a less informed artist. If it's an artist who maybe is informed and understands, okay, oh, fuck with Che, I can own and I can be this then maybe I can, I, I got a chance. Mm -hmm. But if it's a less informed artist, they definitely go into the major because the major's gonna throw down more money. They got I more resources. You just gotta educate them. You just gotta try to, you know, just gotta try to educate them. Just try to get the information out there. You know, right now I send them pictures of Lil Uzi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. is it capital? Do you, can, you, can you raise the capital to like, well, that's, entice them to do, the, to do the right thing, so to speak, too? Well, that's, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. I mean, but it's the same thing even now. Like. You got to understand the funding game to raise capital. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you come, I'm coming from a different game. So when I'm going in there and I'm learning that, that's a different dialogue. Well, shit, you study finance too? Yeah, but it's still, it's a, this is the real life. That's yeah, class. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's school. Yeah. School and getting in front of them is yeah. a different dialogue because you got to make it make sense. What you want to teach people right now? I think, I think the more people that are willing to, I'm talking about, and I'm really speaking to the people that have maybe, put some money away and have done the corporate life or, or, or done it right, right? Meaning they've tucked their money, they got their retirements, this and that. Those are the people that to me got to start, you know, it's like, cool, get out of your comfort zone a little bit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean risk your, your, your livelihood and your, your, your stability, but at the same time, those are the people that can really activate some things mm -hmm. and really, you know, um, you know, because it's the people, it's the black middle, middle class mm -hmm. that can really like start creating more jobs and more opportunities. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a, I'm a true believer in rely on your own. Mm -hmm. you know, don't necessarily, cool, if we get, you know, if we get help from other communities and other resources, great. 
but I also feel like we got to rely on our own. You know, I definitely want to get away with get a, get away from that that old saying, "crabs in a bucket." Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I want you know, I want you know, ladders, <laughs> ladders in a bucket. So, you know, that's what it should be. Yeah. So. Um, you know what really fucked me up, man? We, when we talk about this, <clears throat> somebody that was trying to do everything you're talking about, mm -hmm. right? Create platforms, invest in that community, so on and so yeah. forth, uh, got slammed. Somebody that you advise, somebody that you, mm -hmm. that advise you, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Nip meant a lot to everybody. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, and like, how did that affect you and, and, and people that's really in that space? I mean, you watched it, but like, yeah. what but did that, it mean? But, that, but you? that showed you right there, mm -hmm. and the Eric Holder cat, mm -hmm. that just showed you, once again, the lack of information. Yeah. Meaning, whatever your personal grudge was with Nip, Nip was bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Like, the, you know, Nip, what Nip was doing and Nip's purpose was bigger than that. You know what I mean? Malcolm X's purpose was bigger than that. You know what I'm saying? So when the, when the, when the black man that they hired to come in and, and, you know, and shoot Malcolm, you know, and he had a petty gripe with him because of, the, you know, the nation of Islam and, you know, you know what was going on with the nation of Islam and the CIA getting involved yeah. and people poisoning that. But Malcolm was bigger than that. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, Muhammad Ali, it's like assassinate Muhammad Ali or something, right? He's bigger than that. He, has, he serves a bigger purpose. You know they wanted to kill Muhammad Ali. He was a, he was a loud ass black man, yeah. you know, popping his shit. You know what I'm saying? So they wanted the motherfuckers that fell in line, not these disruptive motherfuckers. Yeah. So Nipsey was that, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and in this case, it was a black man that had a petty beef because his ego was hurt. And that goes back to, as, as we know, a lot of black men get murdered over ego. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Whether somebody hurt their ego and then they, they, they attack somebody or vice versa. You know what I'm saying? So, and so that, that's what's sad about it is yeah. that the Eric dude, because of the lack of information, was not able to have the perspective that even though maybe I'm not feeling what Nipsey's saying to me and he hurt my feelings or whatever the case may be, but this motherfucker is bigger than that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I got to let that go. Right. You know what I mean? Because right. he serves a bigger purpose yeah. for my neighborhood, for my community, for my family. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the devil's always at work. Yeah. I'm not even a super religious person, but I do believe in energy, positive, you know, because that's, that's the thing. When you learn about electricity and science, mm -hmm. you know, you got to have this positive and negative because mm -hmm. electricity don't work without it. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, whether you believe in that entity or not, it's still that, that's the science. Mm -hmm. It's positive and negative. Mm -hmm. And so that's always going to exist. It's just a matter of how can we navigate it. You know, that's how I really started to, like, understand God to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. I'm not a super religious guy, I don't think either, but the fact that I know that so much negativity exists yeah. is how I know the opposite end of the spectrum exists, exists. as well. Exactly. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? So it's because of, like, people doing wild shit and raping kids and doing all that. Like, I know that there, there's mm -hmm. another element. There's another, another element of it, yeah. yeah. And when you start looking at Buddhism and, and, and you know, Hindu and this and stuff, they start talking about balance and energy. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it all starts making sense. Yeah. Because it's just like, okay, the people that are most centered, mm -hmm. you know, almost calm, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like they're these, these elevated individuals. Mm -hmm. Is why it's because they found this inner peace. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing, even from 13, you were very self-aware. At times. Overall, I would say overall, but you know, you get out of it. You know, you get out of it. You got friends who pull you different ways, you know. You know, I'm a felon, you know what I mean? I'm an educated felon, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. And, and, you know, it took me to go to college to get in trouble. I didn't get in trouble ever growing up. When, when the shit was around me, I didn't get in trouble. I got in trouble when I went to college, mm -hmm. you know, and it was more like the lie with dog, you catch fleas kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I just, had, I just had close friends that ended up being big drug dealers. Mm -hmm. And, and we were so cool and close friends, it was just casual. So like, you know, you could literally have 20 keys right there and I wouldn't, it wouldn't have phased me. Yeah. Cause, Cause in my mind, it wasn't my keys. You know what I mean? Even though if I'm in this place, that's obviously a conspiracy. You know what I'm saying? But in my mind, that's just my man. You know what I mean? Like he get his money. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, that's his business. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, and I got his back, you know? So when shit hit the fan, I really actually got his back. But technically speaking, I'm, I'm condoning what he's doing, you know, but in my mind, I was trying to not pass judgment. Mm -hmm. 
So if I, so as with experience in retrospect, I might have said, you know, I still wouldn't. He still would have been my man. I might have kept my distance, mm -hmm. you know. But I and I would have had more jewels with him. Like, is your freedom worth that? Is mm -hmm. you know the money you're making and stuff like that, you know? And it's the yin and the yang. He might have said, yeah, yeah <laughs> like yeah, you know yeah, what I yeah, mean. Yeah, yeah. He might have said, you know, because yeah. he told me point blank. He's like, Jay, I'm good at this shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And outside the uh, outside the tough guy shit, he was good at he he was he was. I mean, this nigga at, at 19 and 20 found out had a direct connect from Mexico, mm. bringing keys. I mean, this dude could have ran a Fortune 500 company. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. As a college student in Virginia, yeah. he got a, a direct connect in Mexico, yeah, got it into the country, yeah. and got it to Virginia. Yeah. yeah. When he got he got when he got charged, he got charged with conspiracy to sell 40,000 pounds. Wow. 40,000. Yeah. I don't want to see another Nip situation happen. Unfortunately. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't want to see that shit happen. Unfortunately, um, it's gonna. Right? But what do we need to be doing? How can you use your platform? How can we, like, what, what, what needs to happen for us to heal so we're not fucking killing ourselves? You know, we're in a cycle, in a pattern of flossing, money, you know, I mean, you go to Graham right now, I'm sure, I'm sure there's someone holding up money, you know what I'm saying? So, obviously, if, if one person's got it, another person don't. Mm -hmm. And that motherfucker's looking at him like, shit, he eating. I need to eat. I want to eat, too. So that cycle is, is going to happen. But what I think you have to do as artists... And, and potential targets, you gotta stay out the way. Mm. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean you don't promote your, your, your art and your career, but you also gotta stay out the way. With, you know, and you know, anyone from the hood knows what I mean. You know, this shit is, you know, we still live in a war zone, the hood, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it's, the cycle is a bigger, that, I mean, that's a bigger conversation. It's not just, it's not just the music, it's a, it's a whole movement. And I think it's just about creating an air of positivity in mm -hmm. the movement. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Obviously, there was a time where it was about black unity and positivity and, and those things. And, and, all, and the music was part of that, too. I mean, and Earth, Wind & Fire and all these messages. So, I mean, it's Stevie Wonder and they had the message in the music and, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not even thinking about the music necessarily at this point. I'm thinking about, like, just people, the access you have and the people and, and, and you, you know what I'm saying, yeah. doing this. I only, know how, I only know how to do it by example, meaning... Yeah. And meaning it's just about sharing the information and pulling one and pulling people up and this and that. I don't know, like I know, you know, I know other people who are like more community activists. I've heard Rashid Common come and speak and say things and you know and really back it up with his actions and John Legend and some of the community activism stuff they do. I, that's not my that's not my thing. So my thing is, okay, I want to really figure out how to give back to the school to the hood and education. That's more my platform versus like community activism. My my version of community activism is more education yeah, yeah. and information you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah. because right. i've i kid you not i've been on a block where i've talked to you know 15 year olds that's in the trap and just you know literally just sharing information with them and to see that spark you're like oh word oh you know what i mean like you know oh shit, you what i, I could stack this and i could i could go cop me a crib or i could do this you know what i mean like yeah. just giving them information and and and, and you just see that spark mm -hmm. it, it shows me that you know we are we are a bunch of black kings and queens yeah. you know what i'm saying and it, and and we have to realize that you know what i mean we can't look in the mirror every time we look in the mirror we got to realize that we are we are you know it's not about any kind of you know arrogance mm -hmm. but it is it is that that is our calling it's self-love yeah it, it is exactly it's, it is self-love yeah. and other people have self-hate that's why they've always tried to oppress us mm -hmm. That's that's just self hate. Yeah. That's that's something wrong with you. Yeah. Ain't nothing wrong with me. Fact. So and now we're in that cycle. So yeah. we got to keep pulling ourselves out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but that, but it is comes down to self love and, and, and sharing the you know. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. You, definitely, man. definitely, man. Right. Definitely enjoyed it. What albums? Ooh. Yeah, both. Because those are two different conversations. Albums, you know, I'm always going to put my shit in there. So, Miseducation, Lauren Hill. Yeah. Uh, Chronic. Okay. 
Um, low end theory, tribe called quest. Um, boogie that criminal minded boogie down productions. Hmm, at last, Illmatic. Yes. <laughs> I needed that. I needed that. Okay. Top five rappers. <laughs> Biggie. Look back. Last week, Biggie, yeah. Biggie, I told you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Andre 3000. Um, hmm, I gotta get, I, I, I gotta, in the modern sense, because I'm, I'm not gonna leave out the youngsters, Kendrick. Mm-hmm. Put Kendrick in there now. I think he's earned that slot in this, in the, in this state, day and age. I'm always gonna put Nas in there. You know what I'm saying? I, I was born and raised off Nas. You know, not, I'm a child of Illmatic. I am Illmatic. You know what I mean? That, Illmatic is why I exist. If there was no Illmatic, I wouldn't be here. You know what I'm saying? I would you, yeah. If there was no Biggie, I wouldn't be here. So that's Biggie, Nas. Who that's? Oh, Hove. Three, yeah. three stack. Yeah, so Biggie, Nas, Hove, three stacks, and Kendrick. That's it. That's a good That's a hard star five right there. You know what I mean? I don't, I'm, not, I'm not with the Tupac kid. kid. <laughs> I think he's well read, and I appreciate the well read and the, and, the, and the activist stuff that he says. But we're talking rap. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Pac wasn't a great rapper. Yeah, I mean, but everyone wants to put him in that conversation and this and that. M, you know, M is a scientist. That's a, that's great. He got he's skilled, but you know, we're talking rap. Rap is more than just lit, you know the skill. It's everything. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's yeah. everything. Yeah. I thought you were my name Hove at first. I'm like, damn. Oh no, definitely Hove. Yes, that's, that's yeah, K K Dot is the only young boy in the class, yeah. and I'm still, you know, I still got others that 